Hello everyone and welcome to the second webinar in the series Social Accountability in the Delivery of Social Protection. This is the second in a three-part webinar, se webinar series organized by HelpAge International in the International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth and hosted on the socialprotection.org platform. The first webinar in this series took place on the 18th of January and was aimed at introducing listeners to the topic of social accountability and its relevance for social protection. The first webinar was quite broad in the topics it covered. And so the aim of this second webinar is to explore in some more detail some of the approaches to social accountability in social protection. And we're gonna be doing this through two case studies. The first is from uh, Zanzibar, which is the uh, semi-autonomous region in, of Tanzania. And we'll be hearing from Salam Mohammed, who's um, going to be talking about the approach to social accountability in the Zanzibar Universal Pension Scheme. And the second case study today is um, from Abdurrahman Siebu Bakar, who will be talking about the integrated referral and service system, which serves a number of social protection schemes and services in Indonesia. Um, we have approximately 50 minutes of presentations followed by around 30 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, next slide, please. My name is Alice Livingstone and I'm a social protection advisor based in the Global Technical Unit of Health Age International. I've been working in the area of income security and older age for about 10 years. In the last few years, I've focused more on voice and accountability and social protection, supporting community-based processes such as older citizen monitoring and the linkages with the grievance redress mechanisms. Uh, next slide, please. So our first speaker, as I mentioned before, is Salam Mohammed, and he is the head of the social protection unit in the Department of Elderly and Social Welfare, the Ministry of Labor, Empowerment, Elders, Youth, Women and Children in Zanzibar, Tanzania. And Salem was involved in building the social protection system in Zanzibar, including the Zanzibar Social Protection Policy, as well as being the ministry's lead technical officer and advisor in the design and implementation of the Zanzibar Universal Pension Scheme. He has over seven years experience working with various bilateral and multilateral aid agencies and international and local NGOs on social protection, child protection and general social welfare. Um, he holds a BA in Sociology, MSc in Social Protection Financing, and is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Kokaeli in Turkey. <laughs> uh, welcome, Salam. And the next slide, please. Our second speaker today is Abdurrahman Siebu Bakar, who is the Chief Technical Advisor of our Integrated Referral and Service System for the Social Protection and poverty reduction in Indonesia. He holds a master's in development administration from the Australian National University and has more than 20 years experience working with uh, national and international NGOs, the ASEAN Secretariat, UNDP and the Vice President's National Team for Accelerating Poverty Reduction. His areas of expertise uh, include social policy work, including on the MDGs and human development analysis and reporting, poverty reduction and social protection, regional pro poor planning, budgeting and monitoring, qualitative research and analysis, local governance and decentralization, political development and democratization, and civil society and private sector partnerships. Uh, welcome, Abdurrahman. So just a note about questions uh, for our participants today. Um, please feel free to submit your questions on the GoToWebinar chat bar. And you can do that at the end of each presentation, or if you prefer, you can wait until both the presentations have finished. Uh, and we will start um, with the questions. We'll have a kind of first round directed at individual speakers and then a round of more general questions. And, but if you have a question that's specifically for one of the speakers, then do indicate who it's for in the chat bar along with your question. So we'll get started. So we'll hand over to Salem for his presentation. Thank you, Salem. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Alice, and thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome, everybody. 
Uh, I'll be explaining a little bit about uh, our experience, I mean, Zanzibar experience about the social accountability in uh, social protection program. And in this case, I will be first talking about the overall uh, social accountability in terms of uh, influencing uh, 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 implementation of the social protection programs. Uh, but uh, again, after that, uh, I will also uh, be looking now specifically about the social accountability uh, mechanism uh, on the so on the Zanzibar social protection, uh, Zanzibar universal pension scheme. Uh, and at the end, uh, I will just be checking about the uh, challenges and the future plans. So I think you went further. Before that, we have a bit introduction about the, the, the program. Uh, so, uh, as you might uh, be aware already, uh, that in Zanzibar we started implementation of the Universal Pension Scheme uh, in April 2016, and uh, we have uh, quite a number of uh, people receiving the, the benefit. Eligibility criteria is just simple. Everybody above uh, 60, 70 years and above is uh, receiving uh, the 20,000 shilling paid every month, and we have about uh, 27,000 uh, uh, people now receiving the benefit. Uh, the, the scheme is uh, actually uh, administered by the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry with the long name. Uh, I've heard yesterday that the name has changed a little bit uh, due to the changes of the, of the Ministry happened recently. But then uh, the program is delivered, uh, the delivery mechanism of the, of the program is cash using payment team and uh, implementation is, is generally centralized in, in terms of payment, uh, but then decentralized in terms of other processes like registration and grievance mechanism and other processes. The good thing about this, uh, this scheme is that it is fully funded by the, by the government of Zanzibar, no donor support in terms of payment of those benefits. Yeah, now, uh, uh, let's look at uh, the, now let's look at the, the drivers of, 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 of universal pension scheme at, at the first place looking at the bigger picture what are the contributing factors what are the drivers of universal pension why did the universal pension implemented at the first place so there are a number of, of, uh, of things that, uh, that that contributed to that and one is the development of the Zanzibar Universal Pension Scheme in 2014, the, 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 Zanzibar Univer the Zanzibar Social Protection Policy, sorry. So the development of the policy stipulated clearly in the policy is mentioned that the government has to implement universal pension. And that has been a huge trigger to the implementation of the, of the pension scheme. Because otherwise, if it wasn't in the policy, maybe we wouldn't have have the, the, the scheme implemented right now. But again, then there's strong commitment of the ministry. The ministry, you know, considered this, uh, this scheme as the most important uh, uh, program to be uh, implemented as the part of the policy implementation. So the ministry prioritized on that, uh, on that scheme. But then good political uh, support from the, the Zanzibar House of Representatives. Uh, and this, of course, helped played a lot of, uh, uh, of, uh, of role here toward creating you know, uh, the awareness and seeking for their support so that when the ministry and civil society organizations were fighting for, you know, for con to convince the government to implement the scheme, uh, they could at least uh, they could at, 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 at least uh, support the ministry and so join in the in the in the team. All right. Then apart from that, then we have all this, the role of civil society organization. It is very important. And here I think I, I, sh I should uh, explain a little bit more uh, that uh, civil society organizations, especially those who are, who, uh, I mean, which uh, who are supporting 
uh, all the people in Zanzibar are playing a really very important role toward convincing the government uh, to, you know, to, to, to implement the scheme. These uh, civil societies use even their own channels, for example, trying to go to those uh, influential political leaders, member of the parliament, to try to, to tell them to use their also influences to try to influence the government to Uh, but uh, also these organizations, together with all the people, they they was they were you know creating the, the demand you know trying at least from every angle from the the, the grassroots level from very low level uh, of govern, governance it means people who are talking to their political leaders at their respective areas trying to tell them that it is now the time we need to implement this because all the people in Zanzibar were living in really very uh, uh, critical condition in terms of income insecurity. But then of course we had this uh, existence of uh, statements, strong uh, political, we have existence of uh, statements by government leaders. For example, if you look at the history of Zanzibar, every president in Zanzibar has been talking in one way or another about supporting all the people. And actually these CSO, civil society organizations, they were using these tools uh, to try to tell them that, okay, the government has been showing uh, since the beginning, since after independence, have been showing the goodwill to implement this, these uh, kind of schemes. But unfortunately, we had no maybe this policy or we had no other, other, other tools to making sure that now the, 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 the stories are becoming realities. So these CSOs sometimes even went, uh, they had access even to the president, the current president, trying to talk to them, to, to talk to him and try to tell him that okay we now need it and maybe if you are the president and we understand because uh, you have uh, you have that will to make things happening and because even the previous leaders had that will but unfortunately we did not have any, uh, the, the, the policy documents so now could you please make it happen so those are some of the factors that contributed to you know this uh, scheme coming into into reality of course, we have other factors like uh, uh, the small uh, population of uh, older person in Zanzibar, which is overall just 4.5% of the total population. It can also be considered as a, as an, uh, as a plus. And uh, we had some several, uh, exactly one mini program that is support, supporting of uh, 11,000 older people and uh, this was like a starting point for us to tell the government, look, we already have this much of, of, of people reached, reached, and we have this much amount of money used for the payment. So if we improve this, we can make it universal and make things better. Uh, so those are, those are, we think that those are the factors. <clears throat> and now maybe let's uh, let's look at the, the the zanzibar social accountability mechanism itself like we have moved from looking at the bigger picture about the introduction of the scheme itself and its contributing factors and now let's look at specifically now at the scheme itself what are the uh, social accountability mechanisms in place actually uh, in the zanzibar universal pension scheme uh, accountability mechanism is uh, presented in the grievance and appeal, complaint and appeal uh, mechanism, uh, which in generally allow all the people uh, to send any kind of claims they have about the program. If they are, if they are denied a benefit, they can appeal. If they are abused during the payment or during any, uh, any other process, they can appeal and they can send their, their, their complaints or appeals at any, at any level, depending on the nature of the, of the complaint. Here, uh, I should mention that we have several channels, at least five channels that uh, we used 
we used to receiving these appeals and the older person can either go to the Shahia, which is the lowest administrative unit in Zanzibar, and send his or her claim. And then Shahia, they understand what to do. They bring, they, they send the, the claim uh, forward to the later, later stages for decision and, uh, and further considerations. But they can also do otherwise. They can go to all the people structures, which is very, very important. I will explain later the role of these structures in this, uh, uh, in this, me in this mechanism. But they can also go to, to, to the district level or they can just go to directly some of them go to the Zanzibar the, the universal pension unit just to have to to seek a quicker response to their to their to their claims so uh so apart from from that now as as we have seen uh, the Zanzibar accountability mechanism and one of its uh, maybe you should move uh, forward uh, two more slides I think one of the of the main uh, actor of the accountability uh, mechanism for the the, the the pension is the all the people's forum and their sources uh, and their CSOs next and their CSOs. It is very important to mention the role of the, these the forums uh, so that we can have a bigger picture and maybe we can even inspire in, in some other, other programs elsewhere. This uh, the accountability mechanism, initially it was supposed to be kind of using the government channels. It means go from the older person to Shahia and Shahia to, to, to the district and, and, the, and to the national level. But then, given the, 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 the complexity, maybe, of the situation, then all the people's forum had to come in to trying to help those older people who cannot, you know, who cannot make those complaints and appeals, and appeals by themselves. They are the one who go uh, to provide awareness to older people about this grievance mechanism, telling them that if you are not satisfied, you can do this and actually not just telling them, but supporting them even in the process itself and supporting particularly those who are unable to do them by themselves and trying to voice their complaints and appeal, making sure that they are heard and at all levels. That is very important. And actually there are cases that we cannot even hear them if they were not functioning. Then the, 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 the representative or the represent, represent all the people in local and national forums also, all the people organization, they are there all the time. When we have meetings, there must be some representations from all the people organizations. But it links all the people with relevant authorities like the social welfare, the, the universal pension units or district offices. And they, after all, they monitor the overall implementation of the scheme, particularly at the lowest level, because there we are not there. I mean, the implementers, the national implementers of the scheme are not at the grassroots. They don't know what is happening down there. But these other people's forum, they stand at our place. They look at the actual implementation at the, at the local level. If there are any complaints from the older people at the local level, they are the one who capture those complaints and send back to, 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 to the office so that we can find better solution. Then finally, then also I try to persuade the, uh, the government to respond to the matter that concerns older people. These guys are very serious. Sometimes they come directly to the office trying to say, okay, we have this complaint, now we need the answer. Because they are just complaints who, who are just uh, answered uh, instantly. All right, next. Okay, so generally those are the, 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 the clue, those are the roles, I mean, the important, very critical role that all the people's forum really play in the implementation of the social accountability mechanism of the universal pension scheme of the Zen, uh, of Zanzibar. Okay, now, definitely there are, there are many uh, uh, concerns that are being reported through those channels, and there are many, I cannot mention all of them, but just let me say that most of the 
concerns are more or less uh, collective, if you can see, even in the, in the list there, we have the denial of registration, which is individual, that one person has been denied, has been refused from uh, uh, from, from application or from getting into the into the scheme, and that is when, of course, uh, the older people's forum comes in to help those kind of people, and particularly those who are vulnerable, who are unable to to do them by themselves. They tip in to, to support, but then there are these like this honesty from their representatives. You know, some of the older people they send representatives to collect their money, and then. Those people they go back to the uh, the to the owner of the money and give them less money. They are supposed to give them, for example, twenty thousand, and they just give them ten thousand and they say, okay, this month, that is what they gave us, which is can never happen. It can never happen under our our arms. And so those older people claim to the to the forums. All the people's forums, and then all the people's forum find. I uh, try to find out for, to find out what happened to, uh, to 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 that person. Why did they did he or she receive less amount? And actually, in all cases, it found they found we found out that um, it is actually the fault of their representatives. And because of this, we've given opportunity for all the person to change the next of kin as many times as they wish because we understand that these kinds of problems, they may happen or they do happen. Not everybody is, uh, is trustworthy. But then there are these, those are more or less individual claims, but we have these more collective ones, like traveling distance of pay points. Many people, they come to the pay, pay point and they say, ah, we walk a lot from our places and we have to do something. And uh, we actually do a lot of things. If you look at statistics, initially we 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 had around 40 something, 46, 46 point pay points. We have now over 80, 84, 85 pay points. So we have almost doubled the pay points because of these kinds of uh, of uh, complaints. But late arrival at the pay point, the, the payers arrive late at the pay points, like they have to arrive there at nine o'clock. Sometimes they arrive there at, at uh, 9.30 or more, or more or less. Then we have use of appropriate languages. Of course, uh, initial time, uh, first times, I mean, the first few months, we had a couple of, uh, of complaints and we had to, you know, to change our cashiers, give them more training so that they have, they may understand. Uh, that dealing with all the person is not like dealing a, with any other person, normal person. They have to be more patient and, and, and more kind to all the people. Then delayed individual payment, uh, that is uh, another case. This was mainly because of, you know, late submission of application forms from their local leaders. Local leaders, uh, they, they, they 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 go all the people they go to the local leaders for registration immediately after registration in in, in 10 days they are supposed to send that that uh, that form in one week to the district level which is supposed to stay there to maximum 10 weeks 10 days again and it has to be to reach uh, dsw within after within 10 days but they don't do that. They sometimes try to collect those uh, those application forms, and so they may sometimes reach two months without being sent to to the next level. And this is a, a critical problem. We have been talking to those leaders, uh, local leaders, trying to make them understand that this program is not about uh, uh, you know the daily business programs that you can go today and forget about the case and maybe do after two months later. Please, next. All right, now, what are the government response? The government response, like I said, in most cases about these, uh, these complaints, uh, most collective concerns such as uh, regarding distance, uh, distance, late arrival and pay point, change of uh, representatives and other, are being taken care of by the government because our intention is to make the program as friendly as possible for all the people to access the benefit. We don't like all the people to complain about accessing the benefit. 
So that is the national level objective as a government. But then, you know, we sometimes tend, our people, particularly at lower level, they tend to kind of um, consider less on that objective. But also I could say in terms of, you know, like categorically saying, local authorities are less responsive compared to the national level in terms of, you know, complaints sent by all the people. They delay taking action sometimes. And I think it's because actually of this, some of these older people, particularly those uh, living nearby, they decide to skip the local level and go directly to the sub-national level, which is district level, or maybe even to the national level itself. But in general, so far, state response to other people's concern can be rated as intermediate because I know there are many, I mean, most of the, of the complaints that we receive now, we, we are working on them. But maybe, of course, we have to uh, put also a reservation that uh, there could be some other complaints. May older people, for example, the case of uh, the, uh, the level of benefit being slightly uh, low. Uh, this is not something that government can respond quickly. It needs some time. So in that case, I put uh, intermediate uh, response in terms of national level and low response at, at, the, at the local level. Next. Now, uh, looking at the fact and now for effective uh, mechanism. From our experience, I could say that uh, um, uh, use of uh, local structures I mean, all the people uh, forums and uh, and their organization, I think, is something very important. And particularly considering the, the country like Zanzibar, which is uh, which has less resources, uh, this on uh, some kind reduce the government costs and ensure sustainability in the future. Uh, so, in a context like Zanzibar, when you integrate local people particularly those who are part of the beneficiaries themselves, you are trying to make the program more, more functional, the system more functional first, but then you are reducing the cost from the government because otherwise the government will have to put uh, maybe other structures in place to making sure that the, 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 the system uh, works. But as a then simplicity of the scheme, if you look at the, sim uh, at the scheme itself, you can, it is very easy to explain to somebody. Everybody now knows that this scheme is about all people 70 plus. They know that. So looking, okay, am I eligible? Am I not? Am I this? Am I that? I mean, there are no uh, problem. And because of its simplicity, at least we have uh, uh, experienced less critical uh, complaints. And for example, if the scheme or had the uh, had been maybe otherwise like means tested or otherwise. So we have, for example, simple eligibility criteria, flat rate benefit level 20,000, which is around $9. Simple and easy accessible application process. Process, you have to go to your local leader. And if you can't, it means you can send your, your representative. And if you don't have credible representative, you can even send somebody to inform the local leader to come to you to register. So it is very simple. Then finally, we think in order to, to build effective mechanism, we also need to have frequent meetings with beneficiaries. This is very important because it is actually by those meetings that some of the concerns are, are expressed uh, spelled publicly, they are expressed publicly, and when they are actually uh, expressed publicly, it is even more convincing to take uh, uh, immediate actions than when it is more individual. Because when it is when complaints are more individual, we have that experience uh, that some of the labels, like I said, may take less seriously than it, when it is. So, for example, in our case. The, the, the fact that we are using a monthly payment, using cash payment team, we use the same occasion to collect some and most of the, of the complaints. And using, of course, the same uh, occasion to give clarification. Next slide. Then what are the approaches to, 
increased government response. Uh, I think the case of Zanzibar tells us that uh, we need to work closely with the responsive res respective ministry. If you want your, uh, your your mechanism, I mean your the government to take seriously in terms of responding to complaints, then those stakeholders, like all the people themselves and their their organizations, they need to work close to the ministry. In our case, all the time, like every week, you will just have somebody from one of these organizations coming at least to say hi or maybe to ask some few questions. And we've become like friends, and this is the target. We have to develop some kind of friendship instead of enmity. And then use tangible evidence in the exist, existing policy documents. Use all the opportunities you have around you to make a case of maybe introducing a pension. And if the pension is introduced, maybe to improve the response to some of these concerns by giving some vivid and, uh, and live examples. Then again, use of important people, if you have like the former ministers, like in our case, they used to you they, they used former ministers who had even access to the president and other influential leaders to trying to inform them and then them putting some influences in terms of how then the government can react and respond to those uh, uh, requirements to their to their needs actually. And also required to meet the influential leaders like the president himself, but proper use of politicians. If you use properly, nicely politician, they can help you. Yes, uh, going to the next, then what are the challenges? Of course, apart from those nice stories, I think we still have uh, some challenges. And one of which is not all Shahias have all older people uh, uh, structures. The older the older people's forum are uh, do not exist in all organized in all shahias. And in that case, uh, this is a challenge because, uh, like I said, all the people's forum somehow they are uh, the structures uh, which, on the other hand, put this system somehow into our life and really make it more functional. And they are not in all shahias, so that is a challenge. So the current system is still so manual and so it's not easy to document every detail. So some of the sometimes you may just go there and ask if there are any, then they say, okay, there are they, they, they complaints, but they are maybe not well documented or not documented at all. There is no legal framework as of now, the, uh, the program has just been implemented, but we don't have uh, a legal framework. And in early stages, enough priority was not uh, allocated to the government to build a strong accountability uh, framework. I think this is very, 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 uh, could be valid that initially attention was more of implementing, giving the benefit, but we are not more of talking about, you know, how uh, the, the, the complaints uh, will be collected, addressed, and so on and so forth. Next. Then some other people are also benefiting from other pro other programs, and this uh, you know it makes other other older people to claim about about the benefit. And this initially was quite a huge issue. Then the government has to see it with you know other government which is implementing other ministry which is implementing other program to trying to now find out the way to get out of it. Uh, lack of strong MIS, we don't have that, and that's why the program is more manual. We don't have the management of information, I mean the computerized one. And some of all the people do not have birth certificate and any other document to prove their age. And this is very critical, particularly at the beginning. So now how are we going to solve this? Of course, there are ways to do this, but you know, in terms of all the people themselves, they may just find it uh, very, very boring because they even don't know their age themselves. So we have alternatives that all the person can just go to the court and, uh, and, and make oath to declare the age and get a letter from the court, then submit with the application form. Or otherwise, they, they can go to our social welfare officers at the district level, get interviewed, being assessed, then get a letter from the social welfare officer and attach it with the, uh, with, uh, yes, uh, with, with the with the with the form and uh, it's done. 
cash management is 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 also a, a, a pro problem because you are paying in cash, counting a lot of money in the morning and get uh, out for the payment on time is quite uh, challenging. All right. What about the plan? So we have quite a few plans. Uh, first is develop a Lego framework to support the Zero, uh, Zanzibar Universal Pension Scheme. Next slide, please. Uh, so we need to have that Lego framework so that some of these uh, you know, complaints and appeals may be solved, uh, may be solved uh, legally. But I, again, improve delivering channels uh, by assessing other possibilities so that we can also improve, we can also reduce some of the, of the complaints. But develop a comprehensive MIS, like I said, very comprehensive one, which is on one hand, uh, the phase has already started, then also struggle to minimize edge three short uh, and increase the benefit level improve the grievance and reduce mechanism as a whole by for example uh, and addressing the other the gaps existing gap like uh, those uh, the, those shahias we with no older people's forums and build capacities at local level yeah all right so those those are among the uh, among the, the things so about the lego framework lego framework i think here i think this is one of the opportunity now because the development, I've heard it from people at home that the, the, the initiatives have already started. And I think this is an opportunity where civil society organizations and even partners on elderly, they can chip into trying to support and try to share their opinions on how this, this, uh, this law or bill should look like. Uh, I mean, considering the best interests of the older people of Zanzibar. So I could say that would be a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, engagement uh, for civil society on the elderly. So to conclude, finally, all the citizen and civil society organizations are important in creating demand. That is our lesson we have got, that creating demand is important for all the people. And their civil society organization, their involvement it is even more important than anything to making sure that people from local can at least speak them speak about the issue at the local level and to their leaders at the local level and those leaders then afterwards bring the issues at their national forums and so on and so forth but programs design and local structures are crucial in building functional sustain and sustainable grievance and reduce mechanism. This is also important. We've seen the case of Zanzibar. In most cases, some of the, of the complaints can just be uh, solved in a minute because it is very simple. Everything is simple. Capacity building at low level is the key to success. We need to build capacities because if lower people do not understand the program, then I don't know how that program will work. So at least they must have a, a certain level of understanding about the, about the program. And finally, I think more investment is still required to, building, to build better social accountability framework, at even at the, ZD, the Zanzibar Universal Pension Scheme in general. We are not yet done. I think uh, we still have a lot to do, improving the scheme, but more importantly, improving the social accountability uh, mechanism itself. And by saying that, uh, by saying that, I thank you all for for your attention. Thank you. Alice, to you. Hello, Alice. Over to you now. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Salam. Um, and thanks for persevering through the poor connection at the beginning there. Um, I think we'll jump straight in uh, to the next presentation. So I'll hand over to Abdurrahman Siebu Bakar, who's um, going to be talking about the, his, the experience from Indonesia. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for, for attending this uh, webinar. I'm going to briefly present a case study of SLRT or Integrated Referral and Service System for Social Protections uh, in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Hello. As as a background information, um, there are three main challenges faced by Indonesia in the context of uh, poverty, uh, vulnerability, and inequality. As we know that Indonesia has a big population, more than 250 million, um, and the number of the of the poor still quite high. Uh, more than 26 uh, million, uh, equal to um, uh, around or some 10% of the population that's uh, in September 2017. Apart from that, Indonesia also uh, facing, you know, the situations of uh, poverty uh, debt index and also severity indexes, which uh, have increased you know, from time to time, including <clears throat> uh, that in uh, 2017, in September 2017, in comparison with the figure in uh, uh, September 2016. Um, and also, the number of the poor is combined with the high number of um, those who live slightly above the poverty line. Um, it is estimated that not less than 70 million people, uh, you know, live under the slightly above the poverty line and easily fall into being poor if there are uh, shocks, you know, uh, economic crisis or uh, uh, other other uh, problems facing by them. Um, and if we refer to the uh, data that contain the or the unified uh, database in Indonesia, around 40% uh, classified as poor and, and vulnerable. That's basically equal to almost 100 uh, million people. And the third big challenge for Indonesia is inequality. Gini ratio has been stagnant for the last uh, several years. Uh, now we are at the uh, rate of uh, 0.391, uh, you know, in September 2017. This is quite uh, still high and also not to mention about regional disparity between eastern part of Indonesia and, and western part of Indonesia. So that's, um, you know, as, as a background. Um, in regards to why you know SLRT as a, a single window service uh, is very much needed in Indonesia, as we know that the government of Indonesia has uh, undertaken you know a lot of uh, poverty reduction and social protection programs, but we are still facing you know a number of problems in the context of the uh, effectiveness and efficiency of this of this program. Uh, in many cases, the poor in Indonesia do not receive comprehensive social protection. And apart from that, you know, the uh, reductions of poverty rate for the last uh, five years, for example, has not been uh, more than 0.6% a year. So there are a number of uh, causes of this uh, situation. Uh, to summarize, there are four. One is that there is no standardized targeting mechanism, uh, particularly programs at the local level. Targeting criteria you know, at the local level for uh, poverty reductions and social protections overlap and are confusing. Each line agency at the local level, for example, using different criteria, uh, in order to uh, 
uh, determine the uh, the targets. Next slide, please. And in general, you know, uh, programs of poverty reductions and uh, social protections are fragmented. You know, starting from uh, targeting to monitoring and evaluations. And also at the local level, you know, one of the uh, problems is that one of the challenges is basically the limited outreach capacity of uh, each program. And apart from that or related to that is basically the uh, the absence of uh, handling, uh, the absence of complaint handling mechanisms. If any, you know, this uh, complaint handling mechanism is scattered. The fourth one is uh, in terms of the uh, limited coverage of each program and also in terms of the limited contributions or uh, uh, nominal contributions of each program to the uh, expenditure of, of the recipients. For example, the um, subsidized rice for the poor based on Susena's data back in 2014, um, the adequacy ratio of uh, 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 subsidized rice for the poor program to the expenditure of the recipient uh, was not less than 4%. Pekaha, the conditional cash transfer is, is better, but it's still low, you know, around 13% uh, in, in terms of its contributions to the expenditure of the recipient. So uh, facing these uh, challenges, one uh, solutions to, to, to address it is to build a single window service. In the Indonesian acronym is uh, SLRT. And this SLRT has been uh, operational since late 2016 and it is under the coordinations of the Ministry of Social Affairs in Indonesia. There are four major functions of SLRT. One is integrations of information, data, and services. Uh, number two is identifications, referrals, and complaint handling. Fourth one, uh, third one is identifications of program participations and needs. And last one, last but not least, is basically to contribute to the dynamic uh, data updating uh, by uh, local governments. So these are the uh, four major functions of SLRT. Next, please. Yeah. In regards to the key features of uh, SLRT, actually, uh, there are at least six key features. One is, uh, you know, horizontal and vertical linkages. Second is outreach and facilitation by local social workers. So there is outreach, pro proactive outreach by uh, social workers uh, at the village level. And then we have also at the sub-district level. Uh, and then at the district level, we have the uh, uh, Secretariat, Office of SLRT, and staffed by, uh, you know, people from different uh, line agencies at the uh, local level. Um, the implementers of SLRT at the local level are equipped with um, computer tab. And this computer tab is, is uh, you know, is based on uh, real-time Android and, uh, and, and web applications. So the facilitators at the uh, village level, the facilitators of SLRT at the village level uh, are equipped with this uh, uh, computer tab. And in this computer tab, uh, you know, you have the, uh, you know, the, the real-time Android and web-based uh, applications. And the other key features of SLRT is the existence of dashboard. The dashboard provides, you know, a summary of data and information produced by, by SLRT. And 
Uh, one of the uh, most key important features of SLRT is the existence of offices at the district uh, level as well as uh, in villages. So these are the uh, key features of SLRT. Next. Hello. Um, in terms of the flow of services and complaint handling, as you see in this slide, there are three channels of complaint reporting uh, via uh, SLRT. One is a facilitator at the village level, you know, reach, reaches out to people. Second is that people can visit the village level SLRT office, which is called Puskesos. This is basically a social welfare center at the village level. Uh, in principle, this is uh, a kind of miniature of uh, SLRT at the village level. So in this Puskesos, you know, you have a front office and, and a back office. And then the third one, you know, people also can visit SLRT office at the district or city level. So there are three major channels of complaint reporting. This is in addition to the existence of supervisor at the sub-district level, but the supervisor is very much bridging, you know, the SLRT office at the district level and the Puskesos at the village level or the village level SLRT plus the uh, facilitator you know, proactively reaching out to people. Next, please. In terms of the expected results, you know, uh, there are a number of uh, results expected, you know, from the uh, SLRT, both in terms of the uh, uh, benefits for the poor themselves as well as for the government. But uh, in a nutshell, the very idea of uh, SLRT is basically uh, to connect the needs of the poor to social services available at the local level. The social services you know, can come from the central government or provincial government, local government, or even, you know, uh, provided by the village uh, level uh, government or NGOs or private sectors. So, so this is very much the uh, well, the, the gist of the uh, very objective of, of SRT is to connect the needs and complaints of the poor to uh, social services. So for the poor themselves, you know, in terms of access, uh, it is expected that uh, there will be increased access of the poor and vulnerable to multi-social services, not only uh, receiving one, two, or three programs. Um, and then in terms of awareness, uh, we hope that SLRT will help, you know, increase awareness of the poor and vulnerable about their rights to social uh, services. For the government, there are many, or oh, there are several uh, benefits you know, of the, uh, of the SLRT. You know, uh, SLRT can help integrate social services at the local level, hence, you know, uh, uh, they become more responsive to the needs of the poor and the vulnerable. And also the bureaucratic chain is, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the presence of uh, SLRT. Uh, the capacity of local government also in terms of coordination, uh, and also updating, managing the integrated data will be uh, strengthened. Uh, and also data uh, produced by the SLRT can be utilized by, uh, you know, central, provincial and local government, even village level government to improve or to strengthen uh, planning and budgeting of social protection and poverty reduction program. And also, you know, the presence of SLRT, you know, will help increase accountability of programs that basically will reduce risk of misappropriations. And of course, you know, actually SLRT is 
in itself as you know can function as monitoring and evaluations for uh, you know improving uh, program implementations of uh, poverty reduction and social protections. Next. So SLRT can be uh, considered as a grievance redressal mechanisms for social protections. You know, SLRT provide multiple channels for receiving and resolving complaints. As I mentioned uh, earlier, facilitator reaching out to people, you know, and then you have Puskesos, a social welfare uh, uh, center or miniature of SLRT at the village level. And then you have also supervisor at the uh, sub-district level. And then there is this SLRT secretariat office in districts level. So uh, SLRT is uh, providing multiple channels at different levels. Also, importantly, you know, SLRT uh, application system is connected to other channels available at the local level. Uh, you know, uh, including uh, systems owned by local uh, line agencies and the conditional cash transfer village facilitator. Uh, village apparatus, private sectors, and NGOs, etc. Also, universities at the local level. Uh, SLRT also uh, having dedicated and trained facilitators. So, the facilitators at the village level and also other implementers like supervisors, managers, and staffing of Puskesos and SLRT offices at the district level, you know, are trained. Uh, by the uh, National Secretariat of SLRT under the preview of the Ministry of Social Affairs. And also we have technical assistance in, in each district or city. Um, it is also important to note that uh, SLRT employs face-to-face -face discussions. You know. uh, so in this context, face-to-face -face discussions between SLRT local implementers, especially the uh, especially the staff of SLRT offices in the, at the village as well as district level and also facilitators with the complainants. Uh, as mentioned before that SLRT is equipped with, uh, you know, uh, Android and web-based uh, applications planted in the uh, computer tab provided to the uh, uh, facilitators. And this, uh, provide real-time horizontal and vertical linkages, you know, from, from village level, from facilitator level, at the, at the community level, village level, uh, sub-districts, you know, where you have the supervisor and then you have the SLRT, SLRT secretariat at the district or city level, the provincial level, up to the national level. It is connected by, by this system. And also it is connecting uh, SLRT office uh, you know, at, at the village level up to the district level horizontally, link to uh, uh, line agencies managing uh, programs. And wherever possible, you know, complaints resolve at the point of service delivery. This is in order to ensure that the complaints are responded speedily and accurately, hence transactions costs are low. And you know, interactively, you know, these features, you know, of SLRT uh, that can be considered as a grievance redressal mechanisms for social protections help address some of the challenges identified by the uh, OPM uh, study, Oxford Policy Management Study, back in 2012 on grievance mechanisms of social protections in Indonesia. You know, uh, the findings include, for example, lack of awareness and entitlement uh, of entitlements and grievance mechanisms, unwillingness of people, the poor and the vulnerable, to complain for different reasons, you know, and complaints at the higher level, targeting, not address, and also people have limited access. So all these challenges, you know, uh, uh, can be, uh, you know, can be can be addressed, you know, by by SLRT. Next, now we come to some results. Uh, if we are to summarize uh, main results of SLRT so far, you know, starting uh, in late 2016, 
you know, there is a change of mindset of local leadership and their priorities towards the importance of horizontal and vertical integrations of social protections and poverty reductions. And there is clearly by buy in and commitment of local governments uh, through provisions of regulate regulations local budget allocations and also human resources and awareness and understanding of the importance of integrated data being updated in dynamic and regular way is very much there at the local level with the presence of slrt and uh, i come to the last point on these uh, results you know majority of slrt offices postcasos already active in receiving receiving people's visits to report and register their complaints and SLRT process, you know, referrals and and address complaints. Next, um, between 2016 and 2017, SLRT is operational in almost 90 districts and cities across Indonesia. These uh, cities and districts spreading in more than uh, 20 provinces. We have uh, 34 provinces in Indonesia and, and there are uh, 514 uh, districts and, and, and cities. So this is a huge country and SLRT so far, you know, is present in, in uh, almost 90, uh, districts of, uh, and, and, and cities. And in 2018, there will be 60 new locations, new, uh, I mean, uh, districts and, and cities. And, and as planned by the government, uh, stipulated in the midterm development plan, uh, there will be some 150 uh, districts and cities, you know, having SLRT by 2019 when the uh, midterm development plan is, is ending, the current midterm development plan is ending. And it is, uh, it is important to note that some of these districts and cities, you know, built SLRT, you know, using, you know, their, their uh, local budget, purely, you know, local budget without uh, state budget or national budget interventions. If you see the yellow, the yellow pie here, you know, uh, 50 locations, 50 districts in 2016, that's very much, uh, you know, uh, built uh, based on uh, national budget as well as, uh, you know, uh, local budget. So cost sharing between national and, and local budget. And the, the 21 uh, start, started to build SLRT in 2017. Uh, that's also cost sharing between national budget and uh, local budget and uh, around eight uh, districts already developed or build SLRT using uh, uh, local budget. So this can be considered as an autonomous uh, SLRT. Next. In terms of the uh, sources of SLRT funding, just to summarize, between 2016 and 2017, and, and 63% coming from uh, national budget or APBN, and uh, almost 40% coming from local budget. So this is very good indication, and it has increased. It increased, you know, uh, from 2016 to 2017. Um, 28% of districts and cities still relying on uh, national budget and around 64% of districts and cities of SLRT uh, based on cost sharing arrangement in terms of funding between national and, and local budget and around 8% of the uh, SLRT locations uh, using a pure uh, local budget. Next. In terms of the uh, referrals and complaint handling between uh, 2016 and uh, 2017, 
there have been more than 650,000 complaints registered at the uh, SLRT Secretariat at the local level. And of these uh, complaints, you know, around 54% uh, related to health issues and the rest, you know, relating to education, uh, subsidized, subsidized rights for the poor, conditional cash transfer, local programs, and also civil registry documents or uh, identity, legal identity uh, documents. And interestingly, you know, uh, more than 70% of these complaints already resolved. More than 70%, only 20% basically being processed. And of these uh, resolved complaints, of the total resolved complaints, about 48%, almost 50% resolved via local programs. So not all complaints basically refer to the national uh, government for 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 redressal, and and about fifty two percent, you know, uh, being referred to national programs managed by uh, uh, national government, and the visits of people to the uh, SLRT secretariat in average, you know, between fifteen to twenty persons a day. And durations for complaint handling, you know, between one and, and 30 days, depending on the types of the programs or, uh, or the complaints. Next, some examples of the types of complaints, you know, across all programs, uh, you know, targeting or participation issues, you know, uh, part of the uh, major types of, of, of complaints. Um, on the conditional cash transfer, for example, one of the uh, important uh, types of complaints being being raised is uh, that PKH recipients being ex excluded from other programs, while the PKH or the conditional cash transfer uh, recipients or beneficiaries are the poorest segment uh, in Indonesia. That's around, uh, you know, uh, in 2000, starting 2018, you know, basically PKH target, you know, around 10%, uh, the, the, the below 10%, while, while uh, before 2018, it's uh, targeting the, uh, the poorest uh, segment of the uh, people in Indonesia around 7.5% below. And based on the data gathered by SLRT, about 13% of uh, only about 13% of the PKH uh, beneficiaries receiving four programs. Other issues also other complaints relating to PKH is late receipt of payment. And in regards to the uh, subsidized rice for the poor or Rastra, uh, part of the complaints being raised uh, is that relating to quantity and quality of rice, loss cards, etc. Uh, interestingly, also um, SLRT received complaints relating to access to legal identity documents like ID card, birth certificate, etc. And also uh, limited social assistance for people with disability, elderly, displaced persons, etc. And SLRT also received complaints, you know, in regards to undecent housing, lack of livelihoods or income generations, including that of people with disability. So these are some examples of the types of complaints received and, and resolved uh, by, by SLRT. Next. Some good, some good practices. You know, in in many of the in some I would say in some uh, locations of SLRT, there is a single data, and the single data database is managed by SLRT, and all related line agencies, you know, are obliged to use the SLRT data. And in uh, some uh, districts or some cities, also 
SLRT is equipped with a quick reaction or response unit. They have free ambulance, free car for uh, poor school children, etc. And also partnership with private sectors and civil society organizations are undertaken in many of the uh, districts and cities of SLRT. Uh, even there is one uh, SLRT in Sleman, Yogyakarta province, you know, they provide free right for those registering complaints at the uh, SLRT secretariat for further referrals or, and or going back home. And also SLRT, as I mentioned, you know, uh, provide services for accessing legal identity documents because one of the challenges for the, uh, for the poor and the vulnerable in Indonesia is that in many cases, they don't have uh, legal identity documents. And this basically prevent them from accessing, you know, social services provided by the government. Next, last slide. In terms of uh, challenges, there are a number of challenges just to summarize you know, uh, we still have limited referrals of complaints to provincial and national programs. This is partly caused by uh, the fact that the SLRT applications are, you know, are just being connected to the MIS of uh, different programs at the national and, and, and uh, sub-national level. Um, complaints at the SLRT office manually registered and processed. So you have facilitator, facilitators at the village level using this computer tab. And in this computer tab, you have the uh, Android uh, and web-based applications. But, you know, the SLRT office at the district level, as well as the village level, you know, the uh, SLRT applications are not yet functioning. But uh, early 2018, we, we tried to build these uh, SLRT applications and its infrastructures, you know, in the secretariat uh, offices at the district or city and, and, and village level. And apart from that, you know, we also facing the challenge uh, in terms of uh, sustainability to ensure sustainability uh, beyond 2019. Uh, part of the causes of this uh, challenge or risk is that uh, the role of the provincial government is still limited in the context of uh, rolling out and helping districts and cities to uh, implement the SLRT. So starting early to starting this year, we we are engaging uh, provincial uh, government to uh, develop and implement the SLRT. The locus of SLRT is at the district or city level and village level, but there is absolutely need. There is an absolute need to involve the provincial government in order to speed up the uh, scale up, uh, as well as to ensure the sustainability of SLRT beyond 2019, because the current midterm development plan is ending in 2019. And also, you know, uh, the human resources and budget of the central government uh, are limited. So uh, we have to engage, we have to involve the provincial government in order to cope with this, uh, uh, with this challenge. Uh, I think I, I stopped I stop there uh, with my presentation. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Abdurrahman, for the very interesting presentation. Um, if you'd like to just turn off your speaker, just. Um, while I am looking at the questions. So we've um, had a few questions that have come in for both the speakers. Um, we've actually had quite a lot of questions and we only have around 15 minutes left. So um, 
what I've done is to take the ones which are more focused on uh, social accountability mechanisms and work on those ones first. If there's time at the end, then uh, we can, uh, uh, I'll field some of the questions which are related to kind of social protection more broadly, because there's been a few of those that have come in as well. Um, so first of all, I've got some questions uh, to, which are directly for, for Salem. So the first one is, is a question about government responsiveness. And the question is actually two questions from two people I've heard. So firstly, so how are the complaints fed into the whole administrative process to improve the overall functioning of the system? And related to that, how much time does it take to respond to older people who have a complaint? Um, and then the second question for Salem is, um, who are the people who are actually organizing the older people's forums to get complaints? Um, so Salem, if you'd like to take those two questions, and then we'll come back with a few more after. Okay, I think Salah might be having a problem hearing us. Okay, I'm... Okay, um, Salam, could you try talking and we'll see if we can hear you. Yes, please. Uh... Thanks for the question. I do not remember all the contributors uh, who asked the questions, but thank you all of you. And uh, just to answer quickly, uh, one, they wanted to know if we had a law before, before implementing the pension, and the answer is not. We don't have it, and I explained it during the presentation, so I won't repeat. But uh, any re responsive mechanism to avoid uh, the complaints, I mean, um, and how does that uh, fit into, I mean, uh, fit into the administration process to improve the entire process? Actually, the, the complaint mechanism has got uh, stages, has got a flow. It goes from the, it starts from the, the, the people themselves, the older people or their representatives, then they've got the flow. Every flow, they go there, uh, it is like if the complaint can be solved at that particular uh, level, then it doesn't has to go. It doesn't have to go to the later stage. It just ends there. But then, if uh, there is uh, the concern is a, it has to go to the other stage, then it is taken to the next stage, and from there they find uh, the solution. Or otherwise, it has to go up to the to the national the national level. So in that way, if that chain is followed, it means the the, the flow the the labels will be aware of the kind of uh, of, of the kind of uh, of complaint, and the appropriate actions will be taken to you know to respond first to the to the to the uh, complaint and to try to make sure that uh, if it is about the problem the system, making sure that the, the the problem won't happen again for somebody else in the future. Uh, then, then it comes to the other question: How often? I mean, how long does the uh, the the response take? Actually, it depends on the nature of the of the complaint. For example, like those I explained during presentation, that people delayed being registered, probably because their application had been held at the local level. Then we had we have to, we do follow up to the responsible leader. Then until it comes to us, that person cannot be registered and cannot receive the money. But most cases, most uh, complaint, they actually get solved within a month. Within a month, I mean, even some of them, for example, for those who come who go to the offices, 
they get solved instantly. I mean, they go with their, their questions and with their complaints and they, when they are done, when they are, they, are, they are going back home, they go back with the responses. And then there were a question about who organized the meeting uh, to collect those uh, complaints. Actually, there are, no, there are no special meetings organized for the complaints. But uh, as I said, we actually use the same payment uh, uh, opportunity because we are paying cash. People come to the pay point and at the pay point, what we do is sending more people, not just not just uh, uh, cashiers, we send cashier and we send social welfare officers. The role of social welfare officers is to try to verify and collect some other information from the beneficiaries, but also collect any kind of claims that beneficiaries may, ha may have. So we don't organize special meetings. Uh, then the payment is actually monthly. Every month we pay them. And uh, we didn't have any models that we followed during the design of this uh, 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 accountability framework. We just looked at the local environment. What do we have and what can work better in our context? And actually to link this question to, to the other one, which uh, required to know if uh, the system, if this mechanism can work in a bigger country, then I cannot answer because then we have to look at the country specific context. In our case, I think the, the, the geography also gives us kind of favor because Zanzibar is very, very small and everything is just nearby. People know each other so well. And after all, people can kind of work, I mean, voluntarily uh, in this case, particularly if you look at the, the older people's uh, as forums, they just work voluntarily, being supported somehow with their, their, their resp responsive, re respective uh, umbrella CSOs, but they actually volunteer. So if you have kind of a country with such kind of spirit, it may work, but I cannot answer, I mean, frankly, give kind of guarantee that, that that will work in other bigger countries. I am really looking forward to see the one maybe if lucky enough in mainland, which I'm, I, I think they are about to, to implement the same kind of program. Uh, and so any plans to extend all the people? Yes, all the people's forum are actually being ex, uh, uh, impl I mean, uh, extended uh, in other areas with no forums. And actually this is the work of DC offices in collaboration with uh, all the people's uh, organizations, Juaza and others. So I think uh, quite quickly, those are kind of questions that uh, uh, that we have. Yes, those are questions we have. Unless I forgot anything, uh, you can remind me, uh, Alice, if I left anything uh, behind. To you, Alice. Uh, yeah, hi. Th thanks, Alan. Uh, no, I think you did a good job with covering all of those. That was well, well remembered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so there was a couple of other questions which were to um, both Salem and Abdurrahman. Um, so the first one is whether there was a particular reference or model from another country that you considered when implementing the accountability mechanisms within your the programs that you've been talking about today. Um, so that's the first question. Um, and perhaps um, Abdurrahman might be able to some thoughts on um, the scaling up of this kind of social accountability mechanisms considering the scale that they're talking that they're working on in Indonesia and how what are some of the challenges been in scaling up um, the SLRT approach in Indonesia um, I think a key question is is around um, when you're working at that kind of scale, how do you ensure that the facilitators or indeed the older person's forums, which Salem was talking about, are kind of working in the best interests of the social protection recipients? 
And Salem, you also mentioned about kind of um, volunteers. So I think it would be quite interesting to hear about scaling up of the approach and the kind of role of volunteers um, within that. Um, so perhaps Abdurrahman, would you be able to answer that first and then we could come back to Salem? In terms of the um, plan expansions of SLRT, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the presentations, you know, by 2019, um, in the context of the uh, national uh, budget, uh, SLRT will be in 150 uh, districts or cities across Indonesia. This is the plan based on the um, based on the midterm development plan uh, uh, 2014 to 2000, 2015 to 2019. But um, you know, as also I mentioned in my presentation, is that there are districts and cities who basically developed SLRT using a pure local budget. At least uh, between late 2016 and 2017, there are eight districts, you know, in different provinces that have developed SLRT using local budget with technical assistance from uh, the National Secretariat representing the Ministry of Social Affairs. And I noticed that we noticed that the interest of local government to develop SLRT is quite uh, strong in Indonesia. So we will see more districts and cities, you know, in different uh, provinces, you know, uh, will develop SLRT using their uh, local budget. Apart from the uh, plan of expansions, for example, in 2018, there will be uh, another 60 uh, locations that will basically receive uh, funding support from the national government through uh, national budget to develop uh, SLRT. But one of the requirements for these uh, districts and cities that will receive funding support from national government is that they have to cost share, you know, using uh, local budget. Um, as I mentioned that in Indonesia, we have more than 500 uh, districts and cities. And by 2019, maybe uh, SLRT will be in, let's say, almost uh, 200 districts and cities. While the, uh, while the presence of SLRT is, is badly needed, I would say, in the context of uh, consolidating uh, and uh, improving the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, social protections and uh, poverty reduction uh, program uh, in Indonesia. And uh, in terms of the implementers, you know, be it a facilitator at the village level, supervisor at the uh, sub-district level, and the staff of SLRT at the village level, as well as the uh, districts and city level, Majority of these implementers are basically social workers under the preview of the Ministry of Social Affairs, but managed locally by the local government. So the honorarium or the incentive for this facilitator is very small. For example, facilitators is only uh, given uh, one, uh, only 350,000 rupiah, you know, uh per per month that's that's very small if you divide it by let's say uh 13 thousand uh yeah 13 thousand in 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 us uh dollars so that's that's very small but they have demonstrated their their you know commitment uh and uh performance you know in undertaking the assignment uh of the of the SLRT, uh, but part of the challenges for this scale up is that to ensure that 
the provincial government is engaged. Because now, for example, the National Secretariat of SLRT, you know, receiving at least in one day, you know, three, four requests uh, from local government in order to, uh, in order for us to go to uh, their their uh, districts or cities, you know, to help with so socializations, to help with uh, technical training, uh, and and other things. So. I don't think that we will be able to do this, you know, if there will be more uh, districts and cities, you know, uh, developing uh, SLRT. So the only way that we can do uh, in order to ensure the, the uh, effective and efficient implementation of SLRT and in order to ensure the sustainability of SLRT is to engage the provincial government. So the provincial government can uh, provide, you know, uh, financial assistance as well as technical assistance uh, to the uh, districts and and cities having SLRT. Uh, our our job at the national level is to train to, to to build the capacity of the provincial government in order to build the capacity of district and cities uh, government. Uh, to develop and implement SLRT. I think that's my response, Alice. Thanks so much. I think we've reached the end of our time with this session. So um, I'll be bringing um, now. So um, just to mention that. Um, we, we did have a number of questions and not all of them uh, we were able to get to. So what we're going to do is um, there'll be a summary in a couple of the webinar and we will include a, a so if you're if you're during this session then then hopefully it will be included on there. Um, Okay, so yeah, so many thanks to our speakers today, to Salam and to Abdurrahman, and also thank you to our audience for participating today. Uh, we've got our very last webinar on social accountability in social protection that's taking place on the 1st of April in about a month's time, and we're going to be looking at kind of some of the enabling factors for social accountability and social protection, um, looking at some of the kind of digitization of administrative processes and legal aspects and kind of state responsiveness looking at those aspects in a little bit more detail so um a webinar series and to access other resources on social you can register on social protection um them on twitter and facebook and and just to repeat, my connection was cordial. Just going to questions might have been missed. To include the questions in our summary brief, which will come out in a couple of days after the question will be covered in that summary brief that's all for today thank you to everybody coming to our speakers and uh, thank you have a good day thank you very much thank you alice thank you everybody thank you thank you very much i like this appreciate it bye bye